All right, so we are at lecture two. We're going to go over chapter four in our FANUC book. All right, uh, we're going to cover what the robot system entails as we go through. Um, we'll walk around the classroom and talk about this stuff as well. So this is for our online learning piece. But what we're going to come out of this knowing, hopefully, uh, just the basic components of, of the six-axis robot. Uh, we're going to talk about what the major axes are and the minor axes are. All right, the joints, the links, understanding. We're not going to get into servo motors. We're gonna, we've talked about that in our motor control course uh, next semester, or we've talked about it uh, in digital electronics and things like that. So we're not going to get into the details of servo motors and pulse and cutters, but um, we should know about them and that we've used them uh, before in other classes. Uh, what the software is and the operating system, different controller types. We have a couple different controller types in the classroom here. Uh, make sure we kind of understand, you know, what, what happens in the differences on some of the major uh, panels. All right, so our uh, robot system, there's, there's four major components to it, all right? We have the mechanical unit, the actual robot itself, all right? So the, the six axis, the arm, so pretty much, you know, everything you see in yellow there with the base underneath, that's the mechanical unit itself, all right? not including a tool for that piece, all right? A tool falls under peripheral equipment. So anything else peripheral, like uh, whatever the tool is, you know, whether it's a gripper, a welder, a vacuum, um, you know, other things that we use uh, with it. So uh, we have the, the, can the camera system or the vision system that we do everything. Uh, some of these can put a head on it so that you can 3D print. Uh, all those different things, all right? So that's another component to it, so the peripheral equipment. Stuff that you add on that the robot can do tasks with, essentially, all right? The software, the software for the robot, that entails what? You are actually typing in commands on the teach pendant, and it's called handling tool. Uh, that's what we're gonna be doing. Uh, one of the robots has a uh, weld on it, but we obviously don't have the welding tool, uh, but you'll see some different commands on there that are specific to welding, all right? And then lastly is the controller, okay? That's in the middle there. Uh, the controller is where the board is, the PLC is, everything, all, everything that interfaces where, you know, the software actually controls all the I.O. and, and where everything kind of happens there. Uh, as far as that go, the memory is in there, the way we back up is in there, every way to communicate with the robots in there. Uh, we got our inputs and our outputs. Um, on our large robot, we actually have external I.O. as well. We have four different uh, inputs and outputs there uh, that we can use. But for all intents and purposes, as we go through this class here, we're going to call it an SOP, a Standard Operating Panel. So when we see that acronym, we will have that. Now down at the bottom, there's an F number tied to the controller, and there's an F number tied to the robot. Sometimes they are the same, sometimes they are different, okay? The uh, reason being is a controller can handle multiple robots on it. So that's why if we ever have to call for help on the robot or things like that, that uh, we need to make sure that we have the robot F number and the controller F number. All right, so you walk into Nissan, there might be one controller that's handling, you know, a couple different robots doing some painting or things like that. Okay, so just, uh, you know, we're going to go through this. You're going to get to know that teach pendant very well. Uh, we're really just going to talk about the, the controller and the, and the panel pieces uh, in this lecture uh, as far as that goes, not getting get into the insides of it and what the boards look like. But what you do need to know is this is standard for every six-axis robot. Um, it, it's just common language, so it, it really doesn't matter if it is a FANUC robot or different uh, different brand of robot, okay? It could be an ABB robot or a Kawa or, or, or different robots like that that we might have or one that you 3D print and make yourself and control with an Arduino. Regardless, okay, there's six axi on this, okay? So the major ones, all right, are J1, J2, and J3, all right? Or we call it the waist, the shoulder, and the elbow. But when we're looking at the teach pendant, it doesn't say waist, shoulder, and elbow. Um, that's more for you figuratively. If you were standing up, all right, your waist does what? Turns side to side, okay? 
What's your shoulder do? Your shoulder raises your arm up and down. What's your elbow do? Extends the uh, exterior part of your arm out back and forth. So that's so that you understand the axis and how it actually rotates and moves. But we call it J1, J2, and J3 on the teach pendant. For us, okay, we're going to be X, Y, and Z. Okay, so that one's very important. Then on the end of the arm, okay, we have J4, J5, and J6. The reason it's called J is because it's a joint. Okay, all of these are J's because they're joints. All right, they're movable joints. So J4, okay, is we're going to, uh, it rotates around, okay? J5 is up and down, and J6 rotates. So when we talk about it, we've talked about airplanes and things like that. Yaw, pitch, and roll. Yaw, pitch, and roll. So that's what J4, J5, and J6 are, just like controlling an airplane with that piece. So, and then on the faceplate, that's where we're, we're going to put the actual tool head. So we're going to have the grippers or the vacuum suction cups or whatever else uh, we got going on there uh, that we can work with. So those are the minor axes, all right, or axi, however you want to go with it, J4, J5, and J6. And they're shown as that on the teach pendant, all right? So on the teach pendant, we're going to have J1 through J6. And it'll say, you know, um, pretty much X, Y, and Z. So those are the directions that we're moving. And then J4, 5, and 6, we are rotating around X, rotating around Y, and rotating around Z. All right, this will make more sense when we get into class and I can kind of show you on the robot uh, as far as that goes. But kind of just went through all those. Uh, J7, okay, that one's going to be more optional stuff. All right, X-rail, gantry, turntable. EOAT is end of arm tooling motion or spot welding uh, that we can add on there. So end of arm tooling, that's really just, you know, our gripper opening and closing, our vacuum suction cup, all those different things, okay? Now, how do these guys move, all right? So each axis is driven by an electric servo motor. Uh, for our little robots, our LR mates that are in the cages, okay? those only have one servo per axis. Our large robot has two servos per axis. Uh, why do you think that might be? It has to do with load, all right? If we take a look at the, the really large robot that we have going in there, all right, it has a really large payload, all right? And we don't wanna overwork the servos, so we use two servos on those. All right, so if you remember a servo motor, all right, it keeps track of positioning. So with a servo motor, we can keep track of X, Y, and Z, and we can record where X, Y, and Z are. So we can use it to hold a motor in place as well. They have an internal brake for them, so we can put the robot in different positions. So a standard one we're going to talk about here is a perch position. All right. The problem with the servos is we can't service them. So if the motor does go back or the internal brake or go bad, or the internal brake goes wrong, we have to replace the entire servo. Uh, there's no way to go in and, and fix it and repair it and that sort of thing. So it might be a little bit costly. And we'll walk around and take a look at the robot so you can see where these servos are, what they look like, all right? Uh, some of you guys, we've already done this stuff with adrenal boards and been able to control some servo motors and, and do that. So we can control speed. Remember, ser servo motors are a closed loop system, so we have feedback um, and we know exactly what's going on. And that's how we're able to keep track of our uh, distance, our XYZ, using that pulse coder. All right. This is the pulse coder. So when we walk over and take a look at the big robot, you will see really this just sitting on the outside. All right. So it's a rotary, right? Rotary meaning we're going around. All right, and if we talk about it in future reference, it's an SPC, it's just serial pulse encoder. All right, so it's what's actually going to sense the angle of the shaft, right? So as the robot turns and rotates and moves, all right, it can detect the angle of the shaft. And that's how we're getting our coordinate system and our speed. So these encoders send back speed and position back to the controller. I want you to think of the controller, uh, you know, just what we're touching on right now. That's like your computer, you know, sitting at home, like your desktop, 
where we're running everything through and whatever you have your peripheral stuff that controls it right is your keyboard and your mouse and your monitor but all the, everything that's handling everything on the inside is like your, your motherboard so the controller is kind of like the motherboard for your computer all right but these guys are out there recording speed and position so we know and the pulse counts for this are they're stored in the memory so when we power the robot up it knows where it is and all these robots are going to be mastered we're going to go over that uh, towards the end of our training how to master a robot but it we hold them in different positions there's positions where we want to be able to do uh, change a tool out or maintenance positions or things like that so we store them and we hold them in memory all right and we use global variables to do that as well that we can set them in, in a program so how does it keep that well when we power the robot down we actually there are actual batteries that retain the uh, encoders in there so we just got to be careful uh, not to take the batteries out too long when we are replacing them all right they're just c batteries and they're usually good for about a year for us or maybe a little bit longer um but in you know worst case scenario the batteries we we don't change them in time and the robot loses uh, it's mastering and we just put new batteries in and remaster it so it's not the end of the world and we have all of our programs backed up uh, we'll talk about that later on as we go we don't have any of these guys but instead of a six axis robot they got linkages um, you can see these are simple pick and place robots uh, manipulation uh, they're actually really cool to see when they go full speed but we don't have any of these guys all right now just some basic common FANUC controllers. So we're just learning about FANUC stuff in general right now. We're not getting into the, the meat of the programming and being able to control it yet, all right? But, but we do need to know some background stuff, all right? So this is a size A or a controller here. It's an R30IB, okay? We don't have any of these. These are for the larger robots. We, we don't have the, the A size controller here. We do have a B size controller for R30IA. All right, that controls our large robot that's sitting in the cage or in the cell, whatever you want to call it. So we do have one of those. So we're going to walk over uh, and take a look at one of those uh, in class when we go through our labs and things like that. All right. So there's a different, there's a different size controller there. Now we don't have the, uh, the open air mate one, the, the R30 IA. We do have an R30 IA mate though. The one that's on the right hand side. Those are what are controlling our uh, our robots that we got sitting in the, the cages uh, there for our training. So, what's inside the controller? All right, we'll take uh, we'll walk over and, and open one up and take a look at it. Uh, remember, that there's a special way to open the controller too. Uh, it's kind of got a dual system uh, so that you can't accidentally pop it open while it's going too. But so, what's inside the controller? We got power supply. Okay, we got operator controls. And we got control circuitry and memory and things like that. So, you know, basically, like I said, it's the motherboard, essentially, that, that, that sits inside this controller, all the brains, everything. So it's taking the program, converting it into the drive signals. All right, it's got the servo amplifier in there, and it has all the I.O. So we can plug other things into here. So, I mean, there's a PLC that sits in here, so we can add different amounts of I.O. And we're going to go over how much I.O. is in there and, and all that in another lecture, okay? All the different communication ports we have, um, how we interface with the work cell, so where our light curtain is, where that's down below, it all comes in here and connects, all right? Where our limit switches are that we have on the base of the robot, all comes in here connects so everything is wired down into here we got three phase power that's going down into here so I'll show you when we open it up so you guys get an idea but we're not going to spend a lot of time inside the controller or doing those sort of things so different uh, operating panels and kind of what's on the front here uh, parts that we really need to pay attention to that we're going to see a lot uh, we're going to have the green cycle start and there's a plastic cover over that so when you guys use that that's so that we can put it into auto mode so when we walk away and we touch we turn the teach pendant off and we turn the fanic key into auto all right that's for it to start and run in auto so that's an important part we have an emergency stop on here that kills everything all at once there's also one on the teach pendant that we have there's a fault indicator on here 
and uh, you know the, the light the light will come up. we don't have any that have the false reset light on any of our controllers uh, ours are a little bit more basic than that and are a little bit newer so some of these are a little bit older as you see them on here uh, we don't have any the multiple user uh, uh, as well okay ours is similar to this like I said we don't have the fault reset button uh, on here uh, and we, we do have the servo hours so we can kind of keep track of them uh, our large one our large robot looks basically like this one alright uh, auto T1 T2 and uh, that's really our mode switch so for us when we are programming we're going to be programming in T1. We only have one robot with T2. I'm going to explain what that is here in a second. But um, T1 is where we're programming. So you're jogging the robot and you're recording the points of where it's at when you're writing the program. Okay. Once you're done writing the program, all right, you're going to turn the teach pendant off and turn the key here to auto. And then we're going to hit the cycle start button that we see. So when you press the cycle start button and you are in your program, all right, your program will execute. And then we need to know obviously if we have power. All right, so it's basic functions for the robot. When we power down every day, you will be powering down here as well. Okay, there it's not shown on here. Let me see if I can go back a slide. It's not shown anywhere on those. Um, there is a power switch. You can see it in the picture here on the size A, the upper left hand corner. Uh, there's a switch there that we uh, turn the main power on with. So that you don't see that on the front here, okay? But all right, so the software we're going to be learning is Handling Tool. Uh, really cool software, at least in my opinion, as far as for programming wise. Probably one of the easiest languages. Um, I wouldn't even almost say it's a language. All the language is kind of hidden behind the scenes and in terms of C, you don't really actually have to write any code. Um, that's what's beautiful about this is you're literally teaching the robot uh, points of where to move and what to do when it's there. Uh, it's it's very nice. I think you guys are all going to like this. Everybody's always liked uh, programming in this class when it comes down to programming the robots because you don't really have to. I mean, we get into some basic loops and things like that, but it's just conceptual. The actual programming piece is very easy. There's not the syntax is like automatic for you when you hit a button. So very, very nice um, as far as that goes, okay? So different peripheral equipment, just to review, we talked about a little bit earlier, okay? But um, the PLC, so for us, uh, we're gonna use the Station 5 on the 870 trainer uh, to interface with the PLC on our ones that are in the cart. And then our large uh, uh, controller, we have external I.O. that we're gonna be using to interface with. Then, like I said before, get used to the uh, the terminology EOAT for end of arm tooling. Any proximity switches that we have, all right, limit switches. We do have limit switches on the base of the robot, so it can't turn all the way into the back corner on the on the large robot that we have. Uh, photo wise, vision systems, we only have that um, on the one robot as well. Uh, you know, panel view, HMI, human machine interface. We don't, I mean, that's really just the teach pendant in our case, I guess I would say, but we don't really have any other HMIs to monitor anything. Uh, we do have one on station one on the 870, but it has nothing to do with our FANUC. All right, and Ethernet IP, they have USB ports so that we can back up the, uh, the programs in, as well. Okay, so the mode selection switch, very, very important for us, all right? On two of the robots, the, the smaller LR mates, we only have auto in T1. There is no T2, so that's good. All right, uh, much safer uh, for us as far as that goes. So what's really the difference here? Well, auto, obviously, that's when we're going to be running the program so that it does everything automatically based on sensors and based on what we've told it to whether we tell it to sit in a loop and wait for something or it's checking stuff with a vision and, and counting and, and doing that sort of thing for us. Uh, that's all done in auto. T1 is where you teach the robot. You're going to jog it around and record all the different points. And based on those points, then you can run your program in auto. But we can also test it 
when we go through there. So you can step through your program or you can test your program with the teach pendant in your hand as you're teaching it and it goes at a slower speed. Alright, so that's really the important piece here. Alright, T1 is test mode 1. Okay, so all the speeds are restricted in T1. So the fastest that the thing can ever go is 250 millimeters per second. Still, you know, fairly fast for what we're doing if you're running at 100%. Well, not real super fast, but for what you guys are doing, yes, it prevents you from damaging anything. All right. In the big robot, if you have to be in the cage for some reason, as you're testing something or getting in really close because you got to make sure that you're where you're setting this tool or what you're actually doing you know maybe you're unscrewing a part or something like that so you might need to be up closer to the robot to see as you're programming so it's not as dangerous in this speed whatsoever because it's slow enough you can get out of the way or let go of the the dead man switch on the pendant all right very restricted even when we go through okay it's 10 percent of the max speed override t2 okay little bit different okay only on the big robot nobody better use t2 as we're doing it i want everybody to stay in t1 okay test mode 2 the difference is all right the jog speed is still restricted so as you're jogging back and forth between your points it's going to be still 250 millimeters per second however when you test the program and you're in control of the teach pendant to see if the program is going to step through correctly when you're in T2, it will do it at full speed. And that's where you can damage equipment and do other different things. So we got to be very careful. If you're on the big robot, I don't want you using the T2 mode. Everybody needs to be uh, in, in T1. Because even when you test through, and um, even though the, we have the DCS, right, that restricts the speed for us, still it can go too fast. And you might be able to, like, knock the camera or something like that. You know, it shouldn't be able to even get to the camera, but you just one of those things, uh, you know, as you're programming. And because uh, some of you guys, when we start you doing different user frames and tool frames, and you think you recorded everything correctly in the right user frame, but you accidentally recorded everything in joint and not in world, and the, and the thinks it's somewhere else and it isn't, and all of a sudden it flings the wrong way or rotates the wrong way you're going to have issues and that's where it can kind of come into that as well so just know we're going to stay in t1 that's where you're going to teach the robot so it's in restricted speeds and then when we test all of our programs we're going to be using auto all right so that's the end of this lecture we've got most of the basics just about you know the robot its axis or axi right the controller what's inside it and you know what makes the robot move so just general basics all right and understanding how we interface with the robot and what we're interfacing with.